But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessings upon us. Merciful God, we come into Your throne room, Lord, at this time. Fathers, we've assembled in the name of Jesus. We just humbly invite You. Father, we humble ourselves under Your great and mighty hand. We ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit to be here, that we can reverence Him. Father, that we'll be obedient to Him. God, to use us ever how you see fit, Father, to empty us of us and to refill us with you, Lord, I pray. God, open up our minds and hearts tonight as we begin to receive the word and we begin to worship and praise you. Father, let us lay all of our burdens aside and all the problems that the world brings. But God, I pray to focus on you and you alone. For everything that you say and do for us, O oh Lord our God, I pray, let it be in the name of Jesus, our Savior. It's in his name we pray and ask it. Amen and amen. Praise the name of God. Got a couple of verses of scripture here out of the Psalm 77. Starting in verse 1, the scripture says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Thou, hidest, thou holdest mine eyes from waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. This psalm, Psalm 77, is a man who is... Under a, evidently under a little bit of conviction of the Lord. And how many of us have laid in the bed at night ourselves, contemplating on the Lord, even praying to the Lord and calling out to God to remember us? And just as the psalmist confessed and said, He heard me, God hears our prayers as well, praise the name of the Lord. And I'm thankful for that this evening. It's good to be assembled in the Lord's house. It's good to be assembled with the saints of God, praise the name of the Lord. Look forward to it today. Got a few announcements. I just want to remind everyone about our prayer room that's coming together over here in our Sunday school department. Uh, we're looking for some volunteers. There's a sign-up sheet in the Vestavir area. I want you to uh, encourage you uh, to seek out the Lord and ask the Lord whereabouts in there you would like to sit in there and pray. Uh, and whenever the Lord shows you what to do, make sure to put your name in there. That way we can get a schedule up that one person is not in there all the time. We need to be rotating it out so that way everybody has a chance to go pray and everybody has a chance to come out here, praise God. Also remember this coming Sunday uh, at 5 p.m., Brother Dave Buchanan is going to be having choir practice to get ready for our Easter service. If you sing in the choir, make sure to have every effort to come out to be here. Also, Sister Michelle Buchanan is also having drama practice at 5 o'clock on every Sunday. Uh, grades five and up, so if you have any nieces or nephews or grandchildren that might be interested in participating, may have for effort to get them here at five o'clock. Sister Michelle will be glad to use them in her play. Pastor Stowe is going to be preaching uh, next Wednesday night, uh, sorry, next Sunday night, April the 3rd. I'll be out of town starting that night and uh, through that, that coming Saturday. Me and my wife and my grandson's flying down to Baton Rouge to visit with my son, so I won't be here Next week, uh, Brother Hoyt is going to be preaching at Wednesday night, so make sure to come out and support both of these. Praise God. I will be watching online, and we do got cameras on the congregation, <laughs> so I can see who's here and who ain't. <laughs> also, uh, we have an Easter egg hunt planned for Saturday, April the 16th, uh, from 12 noon until 2 p.m., ages newborn, uh, newborn through fifth grade. So if you have any grandchildren, once again, Children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, neighbors, anybody that you thought might would be in, enjoying that that's come out, that's April the 16th on a Saturday, starting at dinner time till 2 p.m. Also, talking about uh, Easter, we will be having a sunrise service here at Price Chapel on Sunday, April the 17th. The uh, Brother Hike from the Methodist Church down the road, Providence Methodist Church, is going to be joining us that morning, and some of his folks is coming down. Uh, service is going to start at 7 a.m., uh, breakfast is going to be afterwards in the fellowship hall. Also, I know it's a little ways out, but May the 8th on Mother's Day, we will be collecting pennies for the Smoky Mountains Children's Home. So if you got some pennies at home, go ahead and start kind of getting them together, getting them rolled up. So that we come that uh, May the 8th, we'll be able to receive them that morning. I also remember our prayer tree. If God's answering any prayers, make sure to see Sister Betty Smith in the back. She'll be putting up the prayer 
answered prayers on the bulletin board back there. And uh, there's been much prayer also about what, uh, what the Lord wants to do with the old church out there, what we should do with it. Uh, if you got any questions about that and see me after church, we can discuss it, what your thoughts is or what you feel like the Lord might want to do with the old church. As far as announcements goes, that's all the announcements I have. Let's remember the Doug Casey family that recently passed away. Uh, Brother Charlie Brown, that's Scott Brown's father. These are the recently ones that's passed. Uh, the ones I have on my prayer list is Sandy Jones, Jack Williford, Jenny Jones, Michelle Buchanan, Alice Thornton, Walter Smith, Lynn Heron, uh, Zachary Frankson family, Carter Bingham, that's uh, Polly Pearson's great-grandson, Danny Reisner, Reeve Hopkins, Kenneth Shetfield, Teresa King, Ricky Martin, Lee Dowell, and Emma Dowell. These are the names that I have. You might have a name yourself that the Lord's laid on your heart. Let, us, let God sees that hand. Let's stand in prayer and in faith believing. And God does answer prayer. Amen. Father, I come to you once again in prayer, Father. And I'm altogether, Father, unworthy to stand in your throne room of myself. But I come in the name of Jesus, my Savior, by what he done on the cross so many years ago. Father, we have different ministries of the church going on. And God, you already know all about it. Father, I humbly pray to bless every ministry, every practice, everything, the services is planned, the Easter egg hunts is planned, the vacation Bible school, Lord, is being planned. Everything, God, I lift up to you in prayer. God, that you would bless and it be fruitful. God, the names that I've called out who's lost loved ones, Father, I lift them up to you in prayer to comfort them in their time of loss as only you can. Father, you're the real blessing. It ain't us, it's you working through us. So, Father, I pray for every name on here that's sick, recovering from sickness, the hands that's went up, the ones that's at home. God, whatever they stand in need of, you the God are more than enough. So, Father, I pray, open up the windows of heaven upon them. And God, I pray that you would bless them and pour out blessings. There ain't room to receive all of them, Lord, I pray. And we're going to be careful to thank you, to bless your name, to lift Jesus' name up and everything that's said and done, Father. For it's in his name we pray and ask him. Amen and amen. Let's come to the choir and worship and praise the Lord this evening. God has the power to see through. He's God anywhere because He's God everywhere. He's God anytime because He's God all of the time. And He's Lord of anything because He's Lord of everything. He's God, He's Lord, He's the King of Kings. If you're searching for the Father, you can find Him any place. And the time when you don't feel him near is the time to seek his face. When the problems come against you, just stop and call on the Lord. And remember all of the promises in his word. Well, he's God anywhere because he's God everywhere. He's God anytime because he's God all of the time. And he's Lord of anything because he's Lord of everything he's god he's lord he's the king of kings well he's god anywhere because he's god everywhere he's god anytime because he's god all of the time and he's lord of anything because he's lord of everything he's god he's lord he's the king of kings
Goodbye to sin and things that confound. Not all the world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to, and glory to God I'm going through. He set me free, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see for glory to God. He set me free. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah for that freedom. Praise God. Amen. At this time we're going to let the ushers come forth to minister to the congregation. You might have brought a piece of money you want to give. Father, in the name of Jesus, it comes to a part of our service to give back a portion, God, of what you gave to us. God, I just pray that you would accept it by faith, O Lord, as we give it by faith. So, God, I pray that we use this money. Father, I pray to upbuild your kingdom, to bless those who have to give and those who don't but have a heart to, Father, I pray. Open up the windows of heaven upon them, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Tonight I'm going to be speaking about a topic uh, that you don't really hear preached a whole lot about. If you want to call it preaching, it may be more along the lines of teaching more than preaching. Uh, but just uh, to start off, I'll just let everybody know I got uh, copies of these notes, different verses of Scripture, where they're at on the vestibule area about and going out. Um, the Lord impressed upon me to do that because you can take these things home. There's so much area that I'll be covering tonight and people could be flipping their Bible back and forth when I say something about a Bible verse and you'll find how all the service you're going back and forth through your Bible and not really listening. So if you wanted, I'm going strictly by what this right here is, um, but I would encourage you to do that. 
Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this or not in our church services, but God is laying the groundwork down. What I mean by that is prayer. Prayer is starting to become forward. We have prayer meetings on Saturdays. We have prayer meetings on Mondays. We got a prayer room starting up right here. Fasting. I'm starting to talk about fasting. You may say, well, what's fasting got to do with it? Well, we're supposed to be having revival coming up this year, and I want a revival. You can't have, you cannot have uh, miracles, salvations, not only in our church service, but in your own very life unless you pray and fast. Amen. When you don't pray and you don't fast, all you're doing is cutting yourself out of a blessing. That's all you're doing. You ain't hurting God, and you ain't doing anything else but hurting yourself. So I'm encouraging you tonight to hear what we try, what the Lord is trying to do here. He's setting out a groundwork of prayer and fasting. Um, matter of fact, the business saying that is, is a verse of scripture come to my mind when the apostles tried to cast out a demon. They couldn't do it. When they found Jesus, he cast it out and they asked him, how come we couldn't do it? And he said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So prayer and fasting is powerful. Fact of business, I was just talking to somebody the other day, uh, and they don't really live nowhere around here. They live halfway across the country. And I said, people underestimate the power of prayer. They think it's just words going out, but I'm here to tell you God is just as much there as he is right here. And he honors prayer. He honors it. Especially when you name it in Jesus Christ's name in there. So I just want to encourage you. He's laying the ground, groundwork down. If you want more God in your life, then you pray and you fast and watch and see what God does. If you would, go ahead and stand with me. I'm going to read, be reading a couple of verses of Scripture out of Matthew, the ninth chapter. But let's pray to God first. Gracious Heavenly Father, I have looked so forward, Lord, to speaking on this. Even though, Lord, myself, I'm altogether unworthy to do it, I'd admit that. And, Father, I can't do nobody no good unless it's through you. So, Father, I pray tonight, put your words into my mouth and heart. I pray that the people's hearts would be stirred tonight, Father, that they would be inspired to seek out you, not the church, not anybody in particular, but you and you alone, Father. I pray, God, that they would have a closer walk with you, that the message would inspire them to take steps of faith, to live a life of living faith, Father, in the name of Christ, I pray it. Amen and amen. Some people may ask uh, about fasting. Like I said, most of the time people don't hear a whole lot about fasting, particularly being preached about. But I'm going to be honest with you, church, is something the church should be doing constantly, amen. continually. What Christ said about fasting, amen. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Then came to him, talking about Christ, the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto him, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come, and they are now, when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast." I want you to pay particular attention, then shall they fast. He didn't say, then if they fast. He said, they shall fast. Amen. That sounds like a command. You may be seated. I'll be willing to say that fasting is a command of the Lord just as much as going to church is. Amen. It's a command. I got to study in here. Some people may say, well, what is fasting? Fasting is basically designed, uh, I guess you'd say, is defined as this, not eating, not eating, a self-denial or to afflict oneself. Most of the time in scriptures, it is uh, at least 70 times in scriptures, at least 70 times in scripture, in the Old Testament and New Testament, the fasting is talked about, it's mentioned. And if it doesn't come right out and say fasting the scriptures refers to it as afflicting oneself. And that's what he's talking about as fasting. Fasting, there's different kinds of fasting. Uh, when I begin to, to study particularly about this, uh, 
Fasting is basically denying that element of your being that, you, that is absolutely essential for you to live. What I mean by that is you cannot go forever without food. You will, per- you will perish unless the Lord intervenes spiritually. Same way with water. You cannot go without water for unknown, unknown many days. You will perish. I thought to Lord, and I asked the Lord about this. I said, what about sleep, Lord? Because Paul said something about watchings. Lord said that you can't put watchings in there or not sleeping in there as a fast because ultimately you'll break your fast and not mean to. What I mean by that is you can't go four, five, six days without sleep. You'll just collapse and you will go to sleep. So your fast will be broken involuntarily. Eating and drinking is denying something that is being bred every one of us. And I want to bring this point out too. Eating had something to do with that first sin. Think about what I just said. Eve partook of that tree and eat. That eating was involved in that very first sin. We got our belly full. I got my belly full. When I go through this right here, I want you to hear what the Spirit of God will say to you. I'm not telling you to take off on a long fast. I'm not telling you to do that because I, that's dangerous. However, I'll say this. If God moves you to do that, you best do it. Everywhere I've studied, people talk about fasting. Doctors will tell you that it is not harmful to the body to fast. The old flesh will tell you that it's dying. You go without a meal or two and that belly is done starting to growl and you're getting hungry and you're getting uncomfortable because you got so accustomed to feeding that belly. But there's nothing wrong with going out a meal a few times. That being said, fasting at its heart is personal, it's private, and even secretive. In Scripture, what I mean by it, I'm going to read these verses of Scripture, what Christ said about fasting, so that people will understand what I mean by personal and private and even secretive. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Moreover, when you fast, there it is again, not if you fast. When you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Fasting has been called into practice not only as a personal or private, I guess you could say, undertaking, but in different places of the Scripture, a whole group of people has been called to fast. As in Jeremiah 36 and 6, Joel, the second chapter, 15, and in 2 Chronicles 20, 1 through 4, those are group fastings. A whole congregation is called together, or the whole land is called together to fast. To do without a meal, that sounds odd, doesn't it? In this day and time, I'm going to bring this out to you too, church. Do you know that the sin in Sodom and Gomorrah was not so much their sodomy, it was the abundance of food, their leisure time, and their idleness. That was what the great sin was. Does America fall in with that? There's food everywhere. You don't believe it, go to the store. You can find anything you want, but just about anything you want. If you go in there hungry and you come out hungry, it's either you fasting or it's your own fault. Because there's something in there somewhere to eat and there's something in there to drink. Food is everywhere. We don't realize, listen to what I'm fixing to tell you, we don't realize the influence that food has on us, spiritually and physically. Well, why should I fast? Why should I fast? At the center and focus of every fast should be unto God. Now, I know that there's different uh, request, I guess you could say, and I'm going to give you some places in Scripture here where they was talking about fasting and what they, why they fast. But at the heart and the focus of every single fast is fasting to God. 
You might have the right idea but the wrong motives and you robbing yourself of the value or the power of a fast. They might be some wickedness going on in this country and you saying, you fasting unto God, saying, God, stop that's wickedness. God is a sinner. But I'm going to say this. You can't fast and force God to do anything. You're not forcing God. You're not earning your wages to God to, grain, to grow merit to God. When you begin to fast, when you begin to set aside that self-denial that I'm not going to sit down and eat, God, I'm going to spend my time in prayer and I'm going to spend my time in fasting unto you, God honors that. That is what honors God. That is right there. It's what catches God's attention. And when you get God's attention, that's when you can make your request known unto God. What it is is troubling you. What it is is ailing you. What it is is on your heart. But God, make no mistake, but God has to be in the center of a fast. Period. Nothing else to do because you're wasting your time. Why would I fast when I got my focus over here on, say, my, say I, I'm not saying, say, my cousin. I'm fasting for my cousin. Don't be surprised if nothing happens because you're supposed to be fasting unto God. Let God handle the cousin. That's what I'm getting at. Yes, you got different requests. And it might be a heavy, heavy, heavy burden that you have, are fasting unto God. But God is the one who does the work. When you set aside that time of fasting unto God, God honors that faith and he'll start working on your request. At the center of every focus is God. Isaiah 58 is described, and I want to encourage you to do that. You turn over to Isaiah, the 58th chapter. You will see in there God's chosen fast. This is what he wants. It's described in there. And it's not very hard what all God requires. In Zechariah, the 7th chapter, 4 through 6, God brings attention to his fast. I'm going to read it to you. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even though seventy years, did you at all fast unto me? Even to me? When you did eat and when you did drink, did you not fast unto yourselves or drink for yourselves? He's saying, Why did you fast? Did you fast because you just felt like you wanted to? Did you honor God with that fast? Did you bring God into your fast? Or was you sitting back and saying, well, I fast like the Pharisee and the publican. I fast twice a week. It's all about you. When you get that mindset on there, you're answered. prayers are not going to be answered. God is not going to lend an ear to it. But I'm here to tell you from experience, not only from experience from the scriptures, when you start mixing prayer and you start mixing fasting and faith and putting legs on that thing, you'll be amazed at what God starts doing. Amen. I'm telling you, church. Do you get frustrated? Do you get disheartened? God, I prayed for my children to be saved or my grandchildren to be saved, but nothing's happened. Let me ask you a question. Have you fasted unto God? How much do you really care? How much do you really care about your children? How much do you really care about your grandchildren? See, it makes a difference. We're so accustomed to sitting back and letting God do it, and God asks us to fast. It is something the church should be continually doing, practicing it regularly, fasting unto God, and let your request be known, made known unto God because God is starting to lay the groundwork in his church. He's not going to do it any other way. Prayer and fasting is what's going to get it done. It's not going to be in any kind of special programs. It ain't going to be some kind of building that's built or anything else. It's nothing that's going to be but prayer and fasting and obedience to God. That's what brings people into church. That right there is what gets miracles done. That right there. I can sit back all day long with my belly full of Krispy Kreme donuts and drinking sweet tea and say I believe in Jesus and this and this and this and all day long and I don't see no miracles. Maybe perhaps lay it aside that box of Krispy Kreme donuts and that sweet tea and get out on your knees and get business with God. A fasting. If it really means that much to you. 
I said it Sunday night, and I'll say it tonight. Fasting will separate the saints from the ants, and it'll do it right quick. You get out there and let your belly start growling and get to grumbling around there, and you realize you ain't ate in a few, a few hours, and that starts weighing on your mind. You think it won't, but it will. It'll start weighing on you. I'm used to eating all the time. I'm used to eating three times a day, and here I find myself not eating. What am I supposed to do? You'll start getting shaky, fidgety. That's all that's on your mind is satisfying this whole flesh. You will be absolutely stunned at how much control your flesh has over you. You don't believe it? You try it. You try it and see. Anybody that's fasted, seriously fasted, once they end their, once they end waist deep in it, they'll begin to look at the Lord in a different light. When we read in Scripture in there where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, I'm telling you what, that's a man right there. That's a man right there. He ain't no weak, timid little old thing like a lot of painters picture him up to be. He's strong in the faith. Woo, the strongest that ever has been. Strong man. If a fast is for any other reason, it'll lose the value and effectiveness of the fat, of the fast. We can do the right thing, but with the wrong motive and still be robbed of its value. That being said, you can let your request be made known unto God. There's different places in Scripture that talk about why they fasted. For personal sanctity, Psalm 69 verse 10. To be heard on high, Ezra 8 and 23. To change God's mind. Jonah 3, 5, and 10. To free the captives. Isaiah 58 and 6. Fasting for deliverance. 49, Isaiah 49, 24 and 25. Revelation. You want a revelation from God. Daniel 9, 2 and 3, 21 and 22. If you want to subdue the flesh. 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. Those are just a few Request contained in Scripture about why somebody fast. It's already been publicly, or I guess you say biblically, uh, proven that a fast is supported by Scripture. But you don't hear people talk about it. And I understand, don't get me wrong, I understand it being, being personal and private. Just from a, once again, just from a personal standpoint, I have experienced this. When you begin to fast, Seem like everybody in the world will ask you over for supper. Never asked you before. But when you say, when you get out of business with God, you say, Lord, help me through this fast. It won't be a few hours somebody's on the phone calling, hey, what you eating for supper? If it ain't that, you'll be going down the highway, going somewhere, and you'll pass a billboard saying, like I said before, you'll see a big old Bojangles sign up. Or you sit down in front of the TV for a few minutes and there's a Hardee's or a McDonald's commercial with a big old Big Mac on there. And as that fast gets longer and longer and longer, that thing starts shouting louder and louder and louder. Because that belly's hollering. That belly's hollering. You be, like I said, I'm going to say it again. You'll be absolutely amazed at how much that flesh is in control. Especially when that belly starts eating into that backbone. And you go in there and you look and you open up your cabinet. Oh, and there's some, sal there's some salmon. We can have salmon patties and gravy. Open up the refrigerator. Get, there's some milk in there and some butter. Where's the bread at? And make me some toast or something. Got cereal up on top of the fridge. I'm telling you, it's everywhere. You'd be surprised how much suddenly your eye catches things that you often just walk right on past. They don't think nothing about it. When you bring this flesh under subjection that it don't like to be under subjection, can I tell you something? That's when you're starting to make spiritual ground. Things are starting to change in the spiritual realms. No longer is the flesh in control, but the spirit is starting to get in control. And you'll begin to notice things, church. Then maybe I should just jump right on ahead on towards the end because I want you to hear this. Physically speaking, what do you experience in a fast? 
the body in itself starts to purify itself from all the toxins, all the preservatives, and the additives that's put in food. How is that? You look at your tongue, Brother Wayne, after a couple of days, you look at your tongue in the mirror and it's coated. You ain't been eating nothing. Why is it coated? Because the body's getting rid of all that and toxins, all those preservatives, all those additives, all that stuff is making you sick. I read a quote from an Egyptian doctor that said that a man can't eat all that he produces. He can only eat a quarter of it. And the doctor makes his living on the three quarters. Because of what we eat, what we eat makes us sick. Physically speaking, when you decide to do a fast, your breath will start to smell funny. You ain't been eating nothing. You get up and you brush your teeth because you pus- don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. You get up and you brush your teeth, but yet you end up with bad breath. How is that? That body is working out them toxins out of, that, out of those fat reserves that we have in our body. It's burning them up. Not only when you fast, it's doing something else too. It's giving your digestive system a rest, your stomach a rest, your intestines, your colon, all, your liver. All of that is getting a rest from eating every three or four hours. It's giving them a rest. You'll notice this right here too. When you start drinking only water, after a little while your head will start hurting. Why is that? I'm going to shed a little light on you. It's a drug withdrawal. Caffeine. Tea and sodas have caffeine in it. When you don't drink it, you're having caffeine withdrawals. Your head will start to hurt because that's what it is. See, the flesh is in control a lot more than you think it is. It'll hurt. It'll get to where it hurts so bad you can't hardly stand it after about three days. And then it'll start to subside because the caffeine is leaving your body. The flesh is in more control than you think it is. I'll tell you something else that happens too. Mentally, you begin to uh, think clearer. You're able to focus a lot better on things. You're not cloudy. You're not foggy in your mind. But you begin to focus easily. And something else, your nose Suddenly your smell will get heightened. You can smell things that you never noticed before. And yet that taste in your mouth, you'll have a different taste in your mouth that you've never tasted before. And I'm not, listen church, I'm not talking about fasting just one meal here. I'm talking about feast, fasting days. Days, back to back to back to back to back. Just to share a little bit. You know, you know you ain't, like I said, don't let the left hand know what's right, but I want to encourage you to do it. The longest I ever fasted one time was 21 days. 21 days. And in that, I did feel weak. You are going to feel weak. You'll feel you ain't eat nothing. You're going to feel weak. You'll get to where you're nauseated. You'll be nauseated. You'll get dizzy. You'll start having abdominal discomfort. But that stuff passes. I'm going to be honest with you. After about three days of not eating nothing, you'll begin to notice that you ain't hungry. You don't notice it to begin with, but after about the third day, you ain't hungry no more. It's almost like peeling an onion. How you pull the layers off of an onion, or you peel an orange or a banana. That's what's happened to you spiritually when you begin to fast. God is pulling that stuff away that you think that you need, and he's showing you really what you're made out of. Fasting will show you some things. I'm going to be honest with you, church. Sometimes fasting shows you things you don't want to see. Fasting, some people say this. Some people say, well, I'm going to fast the TV. I'm not going to watch the TV. That is not fasting. I'm going to fast the radio, the phone. That is not fasting. Anything, listen to me, church, anything that distracts you from God, sidetracks you from God, you shouldn't be doing it anyway. I'm not going to watch my soap operas. God's not impressed with that. You should not be watching them anyway. 
Fasting is not eating, period. Eating in soup, anything. Food, I'm talking about food and water here. In just a minute, I'm going to go over the three kinds of fast that a person can have. It's supported in Scripture. The normal fast, which is the one that the Lord, he done, is water only. No bread, no food, no soup. Jesus in Luke 4 and 2, he fasted 40 days, 40 nights. Why did he fast? Before his ministry started. David, 2 Samuel 12, 16 and 20, fasted seven days. Why did he fast? Because the deathly sick child, Bathsheba, he fasted. Ahab fasted. 1 Kings 21, 27, it's an unknown time frame, but he was weeping while he fasted, listen to this, to escape God's punishment for stealing Naboth's vineyard. Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 4, Nehemiah fasted for an unknown time frame with weeping because of Jerusalem's great affliction. In the church of Antioch, Church uh, Acts 13, 2 and 3. It's an unknown time frame, however how long they fasted, but it was for the commissioning by the Holy Ghost for Saul and Barnabas. Fasting was an everyday lifestyle for people. But today you don't hear it ever mentioned anymore. And the church ain't got no power. Fasting is, not fasting has robbed the church of its place in the world. I'm just telling you. Because we've heard it's all about God. It's all about Him. He does it, He does it, He does it. And we got lazy, spiritually speaking. I'm going to tell you something. You can't have the fruits of the Holy Ghost just sitting on a comfortable pew. You can't do it. You're not going to have the gifts of the Holy Ghost sitting on a padded pew. You're going to have to get down to business with God. As that old saying, when you get down to business with God, he'll get down to business with you. Because that fasting will peel away all of those self-exaltation things. Things that you want to lift yourself up thinking, I want this and I want that. When your belly starts hurting and growling and grumbling and you can't sleep, we'll find out what you believe. <coughs> I didn't know this. Talking about sleeping, watchings. That uh, some countries use that as an interrogation method on terrorists. Not letting them sleep. Torturing them. Make sure that they don't sleep. After a while you just go loopy crazy because you can't. They won't let you go to sleep. They won't let you. You say, well, how can somebody not let you? Well, when you start to lean over, they hit you in the head with a stick, you'll wake up. And they rotate shifts. They won't never let you sleep. You stand up the whole time. Matter of fact, talking about that, I read in Israel when they interrogate terrorists, they put them in a room that they can't stand up straight in. And they can't move around in, like walk around like I'm walking. They're in a room that's so close to them, they, and they can't get comfortable in it. They got it built and bent in such a way where you can't, you can't stand up for days and leave people in there like that. To break their will. You're not breaking God's will by fast. You know what you're doing? You're breaking your will. What you want. Fasting will get things done. Here's another type of fast. It's called a partial or a Daniel fast. I would say that this one right here is probably the one that's probably the most fuzziest. What I mean by fuzzy, it's not so much clear cut. You know, the normal fast is clear cut. Nothing but water, but bread, and that's it. But this is a little bit different. A partial, you could call it a partial fast. Daniel chapter nine, uh, chapter one and fifteen, he fasted. Daniel did ten days. He never did eat any of the king's meat. He called out a fast. Once again, in chapter ten, two and three, he fasted twenty-one days. He didn't have any kind of delicacy. Elijah fasted. First Kings seventeen and six, he fasted until the brook dried up. Y'all remember that story? He was hiding in the thicket. God commanded the ravens to go feed him, feed him in the morning, feed him in the evening. And he done that every day. He didn't eat nothing else. That is a type of fast. 
The only thing he had to drink was the brook, and that brook kept getting smaller and smaller until the day that it quit running, then he had to go. He fasted again. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 14, until the rain fell. He fasted until the rain fell because at that time he was only eating bread, oil, water, and meal. That was his diet. He didn't eat anything else. That in itself is a type of diet. I guess you could say if a person had a specific, plain, a plain diet, you could say bread and water. Say it's uh, soup and crackers, and that's it. You could call that a type of fast because you're dedicating, you're pushing away everything else, and that's what they did. Daniel didn't want to eat no king's meat. He didn't want to eat any of the delicacies of Babylon. And he was going to prove to them that God is greater than their God. If you study, I'm encouraging you, church. I know there's a lot of material I'm talking about. Now, you may not know what I'm talking about when I quote out these verses of Scripture. But take a copy of it and go home and read it. What Daniel was proving to these people. Here's another one. John the Baptist. He fasted his whole life. Matthew 3 and 4. He didn't eat nothing but locust and honey. That's all he ate his whole life. He don't know what a tater tastes like. He don't know what a piece of meat tastes like. He don't know anything about fried okra or corn on a cob or fried chicken or steak or whatever. He don't know anything about that. We look, listen church, listen to me. We look up to these great men, and we should. They are great men in scripture. They are great men of faith. But for them to be there, they've done some things. Are we willing to try? Are we willing to do it? Are we willing to do what they did? To fast? Push that table away. Push it away. Say, no, God, I know that you blessed me. You say, preacher, that's a sin. God gave me all this food. I should be eating it. How about giving it back to God? Try it. I would encourage you to start off kind of on a small side. Don't jump on something days, days long because you're going to hurt yourself. Start off small. You want to fast a meal? Fast a meal. You want to fast a day? Fast a day. But when you decide to do something like that, you should prepare your body to do that. Don't sit down at the supper table one night and load up on Bojangles fried chicken and all them taters and all that stuff and fill your bed so full you're fixing to be sick. And then you're going to fast the next day or maybe the next two or three days you can hurt yourself. Start off slow. Eat you some fruit. Start eating you some soup. Preparing your body because it's fixing to shut down. All you're doing is trying to save yourself some pain. The last fast, which is probably, it ain't no probably to it. It's the hardest fast a person can ever do. It's called an absolute, total or a Paul fast. It's no food or no water. And I'm, what I want you to mind right here, there's a couple of people in here in Scripture, when I say no water, they in the middle of a desert. It's dry, and they still ain't drinking nothing. <coughs> Ezra fasted a total fast in Ezra chapter 10, verse 6, one night. I've often heard that. And I believe that. A body can go many, many, many days without food. It sure can. You may feel like you can't, but you can. If you determined, if you focused on what God is calling you to do, that's why I say it's got to be under God. It can't be any other reason. It's got to be fasting unto God. And God is leading you to fast. That's the only way you're going to ever succeed. But a total fast... You can go many, many days, up to at least 40 days without eating anything. But I'm going to tell you something. You ain't going to go no more than three days without drinking something. Because you'll start to dehydrate quick. Unless God intervenes. If God intervenes, you say, well, God ain't going to do it. Well, God's done it in the past. He's done it multiple times in the past, intervening. For people who's had a total fast. Nothing. Nothing. Esther had a total fast. Esther 4 and 16. They fasted three days and three nights to save the Jewish people from extinction. If Hitler had paid any attention to the scripture, he'd have known his extermination Jews ain't going to work. 
Here's another one. Paul fasted three days in Damascus converse, uh, conversion. Chapter 9, verse 9. He fasted three days. He didn't eat or drink anything. Amen. Now, I have never, personally, I have never tried a total fast. Because I, I don't think I could make it half a day without drinking some water. But I probably could if, I, if the Lord led me to do that. Not drinking some water can get you in trouble quick, physically speaking. But one day if God leads me to have a total fast, a Paul fast, I trust in him. He's the one that's going to have to initiate it. Here's the two men that has done it. Paul, uh, Moses fasted a total fast in Deuteronomy 9, 9 through 18, and in Exodus 34 through 38, uh, 28. He, listen, church, he fasted 40 days and 40, night, 40 nights twice. And he only had divine intervention to do that. Couldn't do it with any other way. That was when Moses came down off the mountain, his face was shining. See, we look at all the, we look at all the glory things, but we don't see the work it took to get yourself into that position. I can sit back and claim God all these other things, but in order to claim those blessings of God, I got to pray somewhere. I, ha I, I have to sacrifice time to call on God. I have to get down on my knees and ask God. I, I have to set aside the things of the world to call unto God. That is my dependence. That's what fasting reveals who you really depend upon. Now I'm going to go back to what I said a while ago. Do you get discouraged when you pray for your children? I just feel like giving up. I feel like throwing in a towel. God is speaking to you tonight. Have you considered fasting unto God? Have you considered it? Or are you just sitting back waiting on God to do all the work? I honestly believe God is not going to be indebted to any man. When you put forth your fourth or foot of faith, that fast, like I said, the only way you can understand what I'm talking about tonight is if you yourself has fasted. If you understand, you can understand what I mean. When you yourself have to put your foot forth, I'm going to tell you something, church. It's hard to stand there and not eat nothing in about three days and cook somebody's supper. Because I'm telling you, it's hard. Try it four, five, six, seven, eight days. Cooking somebody else's supper and you sitting there and you sitting there and ain't ate nothing, Brother John, in days and days. You'll find out right quick what you believe. Do you really have the goods when the rubber touches the road? If we want to see the miracles of God, listen, church, not only in church here, but in your private life, in your house, in your family, in your job, and wherever you go, try prayer and fasting. And see what God starts to do. When you get serious with God, he'll get serious with you. Here's another one. Elijah, in 1 Kings 19 and 8, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He did it actually twice. He did it one time on his journey. He got to the end of his journey. He couldn't go no further. And that's when the angel showed up and gave him the food, divine food, the cruise of water. And the food to eat. And on that strength of that meat, he called it meat, he went another 40 days and 40 nights with that alone. Didn't eat or drink anything. But he only could do that with divine intervention. I know there's some big men. I, I'd encourage you to do this. Some people in Scripture, or about Scripture really, the Reformers, you ever heard of them? They lived back in the 1200s, 13s, 14, 1500, 1600s. They call them the reformers. That's how we got the church in the structure like it is today. They believed in fasting. John Wesley believed in fasting. In fact, the business, John Wesley started fasting when he got to America. The great, the Knoxes, the Whitefield, Whitfields, all of these other ones that we, Spurgeon, and all these other ones we great hear about, these great big preachers and, who moved people, they fasted regularly. They knew what it meant to skip a meal. They knew what it meant to push away from the table. They knew what it meant to get out on their knees and get down a business with God. Do you lack power in your life? Do you want to be heard on high? Do you want to change God's mind? 
Do you want his intervention? Do you want a revelation from God? Try fasting. Take that prayer life and put go hand in hand with fasting. That's all you can really do. He's not asking you to go on a journey to Jerusalem. He's not asking you to go uh, to the temple and pray. He's not asking any of that. But you can pray and fast right there. It's a personal thing. It's between you and God. Now, that for the folks out there who are married, let me say this. Paul addresses that. Paul addresses uh, fasting when you're married. You can fast with, a, I guess you could say, I wouldn't say it's so much permission from your spouse, whether it's your husband or, you, or your wife, who, whichever one's doing the fasting, but you respect their opinion about it. And not only is it by eating, but it's about marital relations too. You're not supposed to have marital relations when you're fasting. It's just denying yourself. It's self-denial. It's affliction. Did you know this? I didn't know this until I got studying about this. Y'all remember that Pope, Pope John, John Paul II, I think was his name. The one that passed away, I guess maybe it's been 20 years now. Did you know he would have deliberately inflict himself? You didn't hear people talk, hear about that. He wouldn't sleep in a bed. He would sleep on the floor. And when he, before every night before he went to sleep, he would take his clothes off his back and he would take a belt and whip himself across the back. Why would somebody do that? Because he said it made him feel closer to God. Because his master was whipped across the back. When he would whip himself across the back, that pain would bring him closer to Christ. And I'm going to say this right here, church. I've never whipped myself across the back. I have not. Neither have I slept on the floor for God. But those are good ideas. I can tell you honestly, church, my personal life, when I have fasted, I have felt the presence of God stronger than any other time I've ever been living in this world. I'm just telling you, you want to feel the closeness of God fast. You'll be surprised at what you see, what you hear, the thoughts that you have. Your fasting will be a unique experience that only you and God know about. And you might can talk to your husband and you might can talk to your wife or you can talk to me about it. But I'm not going to know anything about what you're going through until you. it's between you and God alone. He sees what you're suffering. He sees what you're denying. He sees what you're putting aside for him. You may say, preacher, am I earning God? Am I trying to force him to look at me? Faith, you ready to hear this? Faith in Jesus Christ will force him to look at you because he honors Jesus. That is the way to get God's attention is faith in Christ. Not just anybody can get in touch with God. They some, listen church, there's some religions in this world who practice fasting regularly. It's a regular thing. I think it said Mahatma Gandhi fasted often, but he did it as a, as rebellion against the British Empire. They'd lock him up. He just wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink. They would finally have to wrestle him down and start an IV in him to get him fluid in his arms. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to say this. If fasting doesn't interest you whatsoever, it's not something you're not interested in whatsoever, you lack power with God. You push, you're denying yourself a blessing. I can't pray and fight your battles if you yourself are not willing to pray and fight. You see what I'm saying? Do everything that you can. I, don't, I can't think of nothing else a man could do that God would ask for us to pray and fast. He's not asking you to go on a journey. He's not asking for every dime that you make. He's not telling you to sell everything that you got. He's not telling you to come up here and live in an altar or give the shirt or the clothes off your back. But he does ask you to pray and to fast. When you honor those two things, Christ didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. So let me question. I'm going to go back to you again. Do you lack power with God? The modern church does not know the power of fasting that God can bring. Because you don't hear it talked about much. To the world, that sounds insane. What's fasting? What's Hunger and what's making yourself hunger, how does that get you in favor with God? That in itself does not get you in favor with God. It's fasting unto God with faith. That's what catches his attention. He sees what you're giving up and he honors it. 
Job was sitting in affliction. For, I don't know how long he sat in those sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes with those sores all over him, but he always honored God. He never did run down to God. He didn't try to jump up and run to the doctor and try to get himself whole. He just simply accepted God. He honored God. He gave up everything else, and God restored more than he lost, church. And he'll do the same for you. Oh, preacher, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. My young is hooked on crack and drugs. Have you fasted? Have you fasted? No, not me. I'm talking about you. Have you fasted? Have you fasted for your husband? Have you, has, have you fasted for your healing? Have you fasted that you're a mama or your daddy or your young and the cancer will be gone? Have you got down to business with God or are you sitting on a pew asking God to do it all? I'm just telling you, that's what he expects out of us. It ain't if you fast, it's when you fast. Fasting is biblical. The great men of Scripture that we study and hear about and read about and try to examine the Scripture about, they all believed in fasting and they all actively done it. What about at night, church? I would encourage you to get, stop and get a copy of this, all these different verses of Scripture that I brought out. If you're interested in fasting, and I believe you should be, you should be interested in it. Just as much as you're interested in spiritual gifts, those go hand in hand. I cannot have the fruits of the Holy Ghost unless I fast and pray. It's as simple as that. Am I forcing God? No, I'm not forcing God. I'm sacrificing to God, Walter. I'm laying aside those beans and taters. Yes, he's blessed them with me. Yes, he has. I walk in there just, just today. I walked in there and opened my cabinets up and I looked. I walked in there and opened up my freezer and it's full of food. God has blessed me abundantly. And then not only me, but y'all too. Amen. I don't look around. I don't see a single person in here as big around as my finger. Every one of us has got, I hate to say it this way, but got plenty of fat reserve on us. We've ate good the last few years. He's not telling you if you weigh 100 pounds and if a uh, strong wind knock you down, he's not telling you to fast. I'm telling you, but a lot of us in here could fast. And when you fast unto God, God recognizes that. And I believe he's, I'm going to tell you this, I believe he's commanding it. You just deny yourself a blessing. You deny yourself answered prayer. Christ told the apostles, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Let us stand. Whoever's going to sing, let them come on. There's so much material that God began to give me about all this right here that I've tried to write down. You could preach many messages on this right here about the benefits of fasting. I hit the high notes down through there, and I pray and I would encourage you to get a copy of this. When you get home, look, at it, look them up and read about what's going on in these people's lives that would, God would want them to fast over. Gracious Heavenly Father, I've did my very best, Lord, to bring this message out. I've looked forward to it. God, if nobody else has been blessed, I have. How these great men and women who fasted was led by you. They fasted unto you and the different things that, that uh, they was looking for. They was desiring deliverance to set the captives free. God, they, we got plenty of captives in our lives, our, no, our neighbors, our children that's captive into drugs and adulterous relationships, they are captives unto Satan. And God, we've prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we don't know how to pray anymore. And it seems like we're lacking something. Maybe, Lord, it's fasting that we're lacking. So, Father, I encourage the, the word to go forth in our hearts to consider fasting. Because I know, Father, you honor that. So, Father, bless us tonight. I know that you're laying down the groundwork for this church. This church can't be what you want it to be just on prayer alone. It's going to take fast and it's going to take sacrifice, self-denial to do it, Lord. So, God, I commit this church, this congregation in your hands. In the name of Jesus, my Savior, I humbly pray it and ask it. Amen, amen, and amen. If you'd like to come to the altar and pray, 
now would be a good time to do so. Perhaps maybe God has answered prayer or led you too fast. I'm not sure.
They like to think they're self up here spiritually, but in reality, when everything boils down, we find ourselves down here, not where we thought we was at. The flesh is in more control than you think it is, and I'm fixing to prove it to you. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. On Sundays, when you come to church in the mornings, when you leave, when we dismiss, you go home, most people are going there and get them something to eat, and what happens next? Go to sleep, don't you? It ain't because your belly's full that makes you go to sleep if your body's starting to absorb that food and your blood sugar's starting to go up and you get sleepy. That's just how much control the flesh is in. And you'll lay down, you'll go to sleep when you should be thinking about what God's done in your life, the message that was preached. That's Satan's way of stealing that word out of your heart. Because when you get up, you got to, oh, wait a minute, i got to go do this, and i got to go do that. And sometimes it even gets to a point where you ain't got time to go to church at night. But you would have time if you hadn't went to sleep. I'm just telling you, you should look around. Try fasting. I would encourage you to do that. You'll find out what you believe real quick. You'll find out how much uh, control the Spirit is in. We're supposed to be led by the Spirit, not the flesh. You'll find out exactly how much can control the flesh is. And you'll find out how in control the spirit is. I'm just not trying to confront you or beat you over the head with it. But I'm just wanting you to understand. Do we lack spiritual power in our life? Consider fasting. 
You want to see your prayers answered? Consider fasting. You want to see your children, your family saved? Consider fasting. If you care enough about it to take it to God in prayer, or do you care enough about it to fast, to push back from that table a few times and honor God? Say, God, I'm fasting unto you. You see what's on my heart. But I'm fasting. The great man of Scripture fasted, and you honored their prayers, and you no respecter of persons. You'll respect my what I'm asking for right here. And if you're praying, according, listen, I'm not telling you, sit here and fast. God, I want a new car out there. I'm not sure if God would be pleased with something like that. But when you pray according to God's will, those reasons why I read a while ago, it's on that paper, for deliverance, for revelations, for salvation, different things like that, God wants to do that. That's what happens. You're praying according to God's will. I hope you're not praying, God, make me a millionaire, because I don't know if God would be pleased with that or not. The love of money is the root of all evil. So I want to encourage you. Consider what I'm saying. Consider what I'm saying. Anybody got anything they'd like to share with us before we dismiss for tonight? I want to thank the Lord what he's done. Because, you know, I went for my chest, for my heart. And then everything came back good. Mm-hmm. Get to Nutnam, to AKG. Amen. Amen. I know I keep saying this, church, but God honors his son. When you mention Jesus' name, when you put Jesus' name in your prayer request, I don't mean to say it in such a way as this. Maybe you can grab the idea of what I'm trying to say. God is obligated. When you throw Jesus' name in there, that's his son. You invoke in power from that name, and he honors that. Anybody else? Let us stand. Brother Hoyt, thank the good Lord what he's done for us tonight, placer.